This is the Edexcel IGCSE Higher paper from the 21st of May 2019. But please note it's the R paper. It's the paper that was taken in the regions, not in the UK. So it's another good past paper to practice with, but it was never actually um, one that was used in the UK. Question one. Uh, we've been asked to work out the depth of the, the water in the cylinder. So we've gone and poured in 1.5 litres. So the first thing you've got to appreciate is there's a thousand centimeters cubed in a liter. So 1.5 liters is 1,500 centimeters cubed. Now, how do you work out the volume of a cylinder? Well, it's the area of the circle, the area of the cross section, which is pi r squared, and then you multiply it by the depth of the cylinder. So we can really set up this, this equation here. So pi r squared h, so pi, we know the radius is 8.2. So pi r squared multiplied by the unknown height is going to give us 1,500. The only unknown here is h, so we can just rearrange. Go and divide both sides by pi 8.2 squared. We've got the height being this. Pop that into your calculator, you get 7.10 dot dot dot, which to one decimal place is 7.1. Now, I think that was a pretty hard question to be question one on a past paper. Question two, we're told that the interior angle of a regular polygon is 162. Now an interior angle plus exterior angle always adds up to 180 degrees. So if we know that the interior is 162, the exterior is going to be 180 take away 162, which is 18 degrees. So each exterior angle is 18 degrees. Now the exterior angles of a regular shape add up to 360 degrees. So if each of them is 18 degrees, then how many exterior angles are there? There's gonna be 360 divided by 18, which is 20 exterior angles, so 20 sides. Question three. Now I think it's best to pop all this information to a Venn diagram to help answer these questions. So all the numbers in the, our universe, the universe of numbers are 11 to 20, so they're gonna be somewhere in our Venn diagram. And here's A, this rugby ball's A, and here's B with them overlapping in the middle. So I need to pick out all the even numbers and pop them into A, all the multiples of three and pop them into B. So working through the list, 11 is neither, so that's on the outside. 12 is both even and a multiple of three, so it's gone in the middle. 13 is neither on the outside. 14 is even only. 15 is a multiple of three only. 16 is even, 17 is neither. 18 is both. It's an even number and a multiple of three. 19 is on the outside. It's neither. 20 is even. So I'm going to use this Venn diagram to answer all three parts of the question. Now this means A intersection. This A intersection B means it's in A and in B. So that's where they overlap. So that's the 12 and the 18. Now A union B means you're in A or B or both. So it's all these numbers here across the two rugby balls. So popping those into a numerical order, 12, 14, 15, 16, 18, and 20. Now, A dash means just not in A. So the numbers that are in A are 14, 16, 20, 12, and 18. They're all in A. So not in A is going to be the 15 in B and these numbers on the outside. So putting those into numerical order, 11, 13, 15, 17, and 19. Question four. Now, I'm going to get all the x's onto one side, all the normal numbers onto the other side. And given we've got the bigger number of x's on the right to start with, it's easier if I take all my x's to the right-hand side. So my first step is to take away 4x from both sides. So that, that leaves me with minus 13 equaling 17 plus 4x. Now, now that I've got all my x's on the right, I want all the normal numbers on the left. So I need to undo this 17, this plus 17. So I'm going to choose to take away 17 from both sides. Minus 13 minus 17 is minus 30. And that's equaling the 4x once I've taken away the 17. So 4x, that means 4 times x, x times 4. So I just need to undo this times in by 4 by dividing by 4. So x is minus 30 over 4, which simplifies to minus 15 over 2, which is minus 7.5. Question five, write 720 is a product of its prime factors. So this is the number tree. 
So we need to break the 720 down. Any two whole numbers that multiply to be 720, I've gone 72 and 10. I've then split the 72 down to 9 and 8, and the 10 down to 2 times 5. Now, 2 and 5 are prime, prime numbers. They're the end of the, the branch, if you like. So pop a circle around those. The 9 breaks down to 3 and 3, which are both prime. The 8 breaks down to 2 times 4. The 2 is prime. The 4 breaks down to a couple more 2s. Now, product of its prime factors, we just need to list, lift, list all of these circled numbers. Uh, numerical order is nice, but what you must remember to do is to pop the time signs in. So that's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 5. Now, for part B, find the smallest whole number that's 720, which is the number we've done in part A, can be multiplied by to give a square number. So I've started off by just writing down uh, what the 720 is as its product of prime factors, but just doing it by way of the powers. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 2 to the power of 4. Then we've got 3 times 3, which is 3 squared, and we've got times by 5. So that's that bit there in purple. Now, in order for a number to be a square number, when you go and do its product to prime factors, each power has to be even. Now, the reason for that is if it's even, you can then split it equally. So 2 to the power of 4 can be split 2 squared and 2 squared. 3 squared can be split 3 and 3. And once we've got 5 being even, it can split 5 and 5. So we've split it into this set of numbers and this set of numbers, which are the same numbers being timed together, hence why it's a square number. So in short, all you've got to remember is the powers must be even in order for it to be a square number. So how do we turn this purple number, this purple here, into all the powers being even? We need another 5. Okay, we've then got the 5 squared. So the answer is 5. Question 6. So because we've got an 8% increase, our multiplier is going to be 1.08. Uh, if we were, um, if it was going um, up by 7%, it would be 1.07 and so on. So we're told that the price before the increase was 425. So we're going from the original price to the final price after the increase. So we have to multiply by the 1.08. So just pop that into your calculator, $4.59. Now for part B, we're going the other way around. We're given the price after the increase. So it's the same multiplier of 1.08 because at the end of the day, there's been an 8% increase. But because we're going from the final price back to the original price, we need to be dividing by 1.08. So just to run over that again, for part A, when we're going from original to final price, left to right, we multiplied by 1.08. But for part B, when we're going from final price back to original price, we had to divide by 1.08. Question seven. Now we're being asked to work out the area of a triangle. How do you work out an area of a triangle? It's half times the length of the base times its perpendicular height. So we already know the perpendicular height is six. What we're just missing is the length of the base from B to C. Now, if I just hook out that this little right angle triangle here, and I'm gonna call this length a half from B to halfway along, so B to here, I'm going to call that X. We've got a right angle triangle where we know the hypotenuse and we know one of the two shorter sides. So we can work out the other shorter side, which I've called X, by way of a taking away Pythagoras. So X squared equals 7.5 squared take away 6 squared. Popping that into my calculator, I get 20.25. Square rooting this, I get the length x to be 4.5. So if, the, if x is 4.5, my base, which is twice this length, is going to be 9. So once I know the length of the base, the area of the triangle is half times 9 times 6, which is 27. Question 10. We're told that the mean weight of the 10 people is 79.2. So the total weight of the 10 people is 10 lots of 79.2, which is 792. Now, we're more, we're more used to working out the mean when we're given the total and the number of people, aren't we? So if we've been told that the total weight was 792 across 10 people, what's the mean average weight? We'd have done 792 divided by 10. This is just the other way around. You've got to be comfortable with going from a mean to the total. 
Now, similarly, we're told that the three people who get out of the lift, their mean weight was 68. So how much did those three people weigh? It's three lots of 68, which is 204. So 792 is the weight for the 10 people, 204 for the three people. So if we take one away from the other, that gives us the weight of the seven people, which is 588. So their mean weight is their total weight of 588 divided by the seven of them, which is 84. Question nine. Now, the index laws, when we divide, we subtract the powers. Nine take away three is six. When we multiply, we add the powers. Five add seven is 12. Now, for part C, just attach the cubing to each component. So we're going to cube the five, we're going to cube the x, and we're going to cube the y squared. Now, five cubed is just five times five times five, which is 125. x cubed is just x cubed. And when you've got a power inside and outside the bracket, you multiply them together, two, three to six. So that's y to the power of six. Question 10. Now we're being asked to change 22 meters per second into kilometers per hour. So 22 meters in one second. If we multiply this by 60, we get 60 seconds, which is one minute. So multiplying 22 by 60, we would go 1,320 meters in one minute. Now, if I multiply that by 60 again, I go from one minute to 60 minutes, which is an hour. So multiplying the 1320 by 60, I now know that I go 79,200 meters in the hour but we want it in kilometers. There are a thousand kilometers in a meter. So we divide the 79,200 by a thousand to give us 79.2 kilometers per hour. Question 11. Now I think this is quite tricky. Now let's think about the ratio of ages now. So Tom to Clemmy, Tom is 15 years old and Clemmy is X. Now, three years ago, Let's just take three away from each of these. Tom is obviously 12, three years ago, 15 take away three. And in terms of X, Clemmy's going to be X minus three. Now we're told that three years ago, the ratio was two to seven. So 12 to X minus three is in the ratio of two to seven. So if we look at the vertical relationship, how do we go from two to 12? We multiply by six. So similarly, how would we go from the seven to the X minus three? We would multiply by six. So this is us constructing our equation. Seven multiplied by six has to equal X minus three. So once we've got that far, that's obviously quite straightforward to solve. Seven sixes are 42, so 42 equals X minus three. Add three to both sides, X equals 45. Question 12. Now pressure equals force over area, and we're being asked to work out uh, P and Q, where P is the maximum pressure and Q is the minimum pressure. Now, for both occasions, the force remains unchanged. It's going to be 105. So what we, what we can alter is the area. Now, think about our box, which is 5 metres by 4 metres by 3 metres. We've got three possible areas of the, um, the side that's touching the floor. It could be the 5 and the 4 are touching the floor, so an area of 20. 5 times 3 is 15, or 4 threes are 12. So we've got a maximum area of 20, a minimum area of 12. Now, when I'm working out the maximum pressure, I've got my force, but I want this to be divided by the minimum area. Okay, to maximize the pressure, I want my constant force divided by the minimum area. Now my minimum area is 12. So my maximum pressure is my 105 force divided by my minimum area of 12, which is 8.75. Now Q, which is my minimum pressure, is gonna be the force divided by the maximum area. The maximum area being five fours of 20. So that's going to be 105 divided by 20, which is 5.25. So that's what Q is, P is 8.75. We're being asked to work out the value of P take away Q. 8.75 take away 5.25 is 3.5.
Question 13. Now these are quite tricky, I think. You've really got to sort of think these through. Now this, this first bit here, A union B uh, dash, means not A union B. So A union B would be the two white footballs here, which are up here. So not A union B is the area that I've shaded in green. So everything apart from the white and the blue circles. But the area we want is A union B dash, intersection C. So where does that green area intersect with the C football? So I've gone and shaded in orange the C football. So where are the green and the orange overlapping? It's in that area there that I've just marked in red. So that's my final answer, that bit in red. Now for part B, use set notation to describe the shaded region in the Venn diagram below. I think there are a number of, of, of possible answers to this. The one I've come up with is it's D union E, so that's the bit in green, intersection F. So where does the green intersect with the orange? It's in these areas here. So D union E, put it in brackets to make it clear that's what comes first and then intersection F. Question 14. Now we're told that the probability um, of going by bus is 0 0.3, so therefore walking, which is the other option, must be 0 0.7 because these two have to up, add up to a whole. Now the question tells us that when he goes to college by bus, the chances of being late is 0 0.2. So there's my 0 0.2. So when he goes by bus, the chances of him being not late has to be one take away 0 0.2, which is 0 0.8. The question tells us that when he walks to college, probability of being late is 0 0.1. So that goes here. And therefore, again, because these two must add up to a whole, when he walks to college, the chances of not being late must be 0 0.9. So in short, these, these, these um, like crocodile mice here, if you like, they've always got to add up to a whole. So that's part A. Now for part B, we've got to work out an estimate for the number of days Barney will be late for college next year. So how can he be late? He can be late if he goes by bus, so this branch and this branch. So what's the probability of him going by bus and being late? It's 0 0.3 multiplied by 0 0.2, which is 0 0.06. Or alternatively, he could be late if he walks. So it's these two branches here. So it's 0 0.7 multiplied by 0 0.1 which is 0 0.07. So those are the two possible ways of being late. So I've worked each of those out individually. Now the chances of being late overall is gonna be these two added together, which is 0 0.13. So any particular day, the probability of Barney being late is 0 0.13. So over 200 days, how often would you expect him to be late? It's gonna be 200 times 0 0.13, which is 26. Question 15. Now we're being asked to work out an equation for L2. So to work out an equation of a straight line, you need two things. You need to know the gradient, uh, which we'll come back to in a minute. And we need to know a point on the line, which we know. We know it goes through nine minus one. Now, how are we gonna work out the gradient of L2? Well, we know that it's perpendicular to L1. So if we can work out the gradient of L1, we can then work out the gradient of L2. So back to L1, we're told that 2y equals 6x minus 5. Now, if we can go and put this into y equals mx plus c format, then m is the gradient. So we've presently got 2y, but we want just single y. So we're going to choose to divide both sides by 2. So we get y equaling 3x minus 5 over 2. So the gradient is, is 3. So the gradient of L1 is 3. Now the gradient of a perpendicular line is therefore minus a third. Now how did we do that? We flipped it over and changed the sign. So three is effectively three over one. So we flip that over to get one over three and change the sign so it's minus one over three. More formally, the gradient three times minus a third would give you minus one. So the gradient is minus a third. So now that we know a gradient and a point, we can substitute this information into the y minus y1 formula. So y minus minus one equals minus a third x minus nine. And um, just tidying up the left-hand side, minusing a minus one is adding one.
Now, because I want this on the answer in this format, I'm going to choose at this point, rather than do the claw and just generate some thirds, I'm going to choose to multiply both sides by 3. So on my left-hand side, I get 3y plus 3. Now, multiplying by 3 undoes this dividing by 3, but it leaves me with a minus 1. Now, minus 1 times x is minus x, and minus 1 times minus 9 is plus 9. So carefully, you get a plus 9 here. Now, just to get it then into the format that they want, like this, I'm adding x to both sides. So 3y plus x plus 3 equals 9, and I'm taking away 3 to get a final answer of 3y plus x equaling 6. Question 16. Now, for part A, I'm being asked to find an expression for v for the velocity. Okay, so we've got the displacement formula, and you just need to learn that when you differentiate displacement, you get velocity. The rate of change of displacement is velocity. So how do we differentiate? Well, it, for each term, you start off by multiplying by the present power, and then secondly, reducing the power by 1. So 4t cubed, multiplying by the 3, gives us 12t, and then reducing the power by 1 cubed becomes squared. And the same with the second term, minus 6t squared, multiplied by the 2 gives us minus 12t, and the 2 becomes 1, so it's just minus 12t to the power of 1, which is just minus 12t, and then 5t just becomes plus 5. So that's our answer to part A. Now, to find acceleration, you differentiate velocity. Okay, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So we've just got to differentiate our answer from part A. So multiply by the current power gives us 24t, and minus 12t just becomes minus 12. Now that's the, the formula for acceleration, and we're asked to find the time when the acceleration equals 6. So set this equal to 6 and solve. So 24t minus 12 equals 6, add 12 to both sides, divide by 24, we get t being 3 quarters or 0.75 seconds. Question 17. Now we're being asked to work out the total number of passengers on the plane. Now remember with a histogram, the area equals the frequency. So the first thing I've got to do is really break the code. So what information am I told? I'm told 24 passengers are aged between 40 and 60. So this area here from 40 to 60 represents 24 passengers. Now, in terms of baby squares, how many squares are in this area? Well, we've got a base of 20, a height of 6, 20 times 6 is 120. So 120 of these baby squares represent 24 passengers. So if I now go and divide both sides by 120, each of those tiny little baby squares represents 0.2 passengers. So now that I've broken the code, if I now go and work out how many baby squares we've got in total, I can then just multiply that by 0.2 to work out how many passengers were on the plane. So I've now just got to work out each of these areas in turn. So this first one here, it's got a base of 10, a height of 2, that's 20 baby squares. Base of 10, height of 9, that's 90. Base of 5, height of 32, that's 160. Base of 15, height of 10, that's 150. And the one we've already done, 120. Then finally over here, base of 20, height of 4, that's 80. So adding up each of those baby square areas, which are highlighted in yellow, I get 620 baby squares. And as I said before, each baby square is 0.2 of a passenger. So 620 times 0.2 means there are 124 people on the plane. Now for part B, work out an estimate for the probability that this person is older than 55 years. Now I'm just going to do this in terms of baby squares because it's just a proportion. So you could equally have done it in terms of passengers, but I think it's easier to do it in terms of baby squares. So how many baby squares are greater than 55? Well here I've got a base of 5 here going from 55 to 60 and a height of 6. So that little area there from 55 to 60 
is 30 baby squares. And then I've got my 80 baby squares already here. So how many baby squares are over 55? It's 30 plus 80, which is 110. That's out of 620 baby squares in total. Dividing top and bottom by 10, that gives me a probability of 11 out of 62. Question 18. So we've got three pairs, three brackets to multiply out. It doesn't matter which order you're going to do it in. So I'm going to start off by multiplying out the two in yellow, which I've just done as a side working here. So 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times minus 7 is minus 14x. 3 times x is plus 3x. 3 times minus 7 is minus 21. Gather up the x's in the middle. I get 2x squared minus 11x minus 21. So I take that back over to my left-hand side. That's the two bits in yellow multiplied out. And I'm now just going to have to multiply that by the x plus 2. So I have six clause here. I do x times 2x squared, x times minus 11x, x times minus 21, and then two times each of the three term, to, uh, uh, terms in turn. So I get 2x cubed minus 11x squared minus 21x plus 4x squared minus 22x minus 42. And gather up my x squareds and gather up my x's, I get this as a final answer. Now, for part B, make M the subject of this. So first step, we want to move away from having a fraction. So choose to multiply both sides by 2m minus y. So I get p squared times 2m minus y, equaling the numerator on the right-hand side. Now do the claw. So this first p squared times 2m gives me 2m p squared, and p squared times minus y is minus p squared y. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to rearrange to get everything with m on the left, everything without m on the right. So I've taken away uh, an m from both sides, and I've added a p squared y to both sides to give me the second bottom line. Now that I've got all my m terms on the left, I can factorise that. So I can take out the m, giving me m, open bracket, 2p squared minus 1. And then finally, now that I've isolated m, I can divide both sides by the bracket, giving me a final answer of x plus p squared y all over 2p squared minus y, the bracket no longer being needed. Question 19. The first sentence tells us that the 25th term of an arithmetic series is 44.5. Now, if it's the 25th term, that's when it's a plus 24d. There's always one difference between the number of d's and the position in the sequence. Now, if you're not clear on that, let me just run you over just a basic um revision of, of how an arithmetic uh, series works or, or sequence works for this bit. So here's on my first term, my second term, my third term, my fourth term. Let's just imagine we've got a simple situation where the first term was one and then we're going up by two each time. Okay, just imagine that was our, our sequence. So the, uh, A would be um, one because and then to get the three we'd add on the D, to get the five we'd add on another D, to get the 7, we'd add on to another d. So you can see the, the difference between the number of d's and the position in the sequence is always one less, okay? Our fourth term, so when n is 4, is a plus 3d. Anyway, so back to um, the left-hand side working. So a plus 24d equals 44.5, okay? 25th position, 24 lots of d's. Now, the second fact we're given is that the sum of the first 30 terms is 765. So at this point, we're going to use the formula that's given in the formulas at the front of the paper, okay, where we've got um, A being, um, we're told the sum of the first is 765, yeah. So we don't know what A is, we don't know what D is, but we, what we do know that it's the first 30 terms. So we know that N equals 30. And we obviously know that the sum is 765. So substituting in, we get 30 over 2, you know, the n over the 2, plus 2a, 2a plus n, which is 30 minus 1, lots of d, equaling 765. Okay, we're told it's 765. So uh, 30 over 2 is obviously 15. 30 take away 1 is 29. 
I've then gone and just divided both sides by 15 to get 2a plus 29d equals, 5, uh, equals uh, 51. So I've got two equations, equation one up here and equation two down here with two unknowns. So I've got a simultaneous equation to solve. So you could do it by way of substitution. You know, you can make A the subject and substitute in. I'm just going to do it by elimination. So I'm going to um, double up my equation number one. So if I double up this equation here, I get two lots of A plus 48 lots of D equaling 89. I line that up with my equation number two. 2a plus 29d equals 51. So I've now lined up my two a's. So I can now take away the second equation from the first one. 2a take away 2a is nothing. 48d take away 29d is 19d. And 89 minus 51 is 38. Dividing by 19, I've worked out that d, my common difference is 2. Now substituting this back into either of the original two formulas, I've taken at formula 1, we've got a plus 24 lots of d, so 24 lots of 2 equaling 44.5. It's 24 lots of 2 is obviously 48. Take away 48 from both sides, we get A, our opening term being minus 3.5. So we know what A and D is, so we can now go and work out what the 16th term is. The 16th term is when it's A plus 15D. Remember again, the difference between the position and the number of Ds. So substituting in that A is minus 3.5 and D is 2, we get the 16th term being 26.5. Question 20. So um, I think to get a to the power of 3 over 2, I'm first of all going to square root and then cube. Now the square root, obviously the square root of 25 is 5. And you just got to think about this a little bit, but the square root of 10 to the power of 14n is 10 to the 7n. You just halve the power. Okay, so think about that over here in red. 10 to the 14n could be rewritten as 10 to the 7n in brackets and the two outside, because of course, when, we, when you've got a power inside and outside the bracket, you multiply them together. So therefore we can see if we're gonna square root 10 to the 14n, which is the same as this, we just lose the squaring giving us 10 to the 7n. So I think that's quite a big step to go from the 10 to the 14n to 10 to the 7n. Now, once we've got that, we're then cubing that. So five times five times five, and then um, similar to what I was saying up here, when we were square rooting, we were halving. When we're cubing, we're gonna be timesing the power by three, okay? Again, I think that's easier to envisage, isn't it? 10 to the 7n, in a bracket with the 3 on the outside, you multiply the powers together. 10 to the 7n times 3 will be 10 to the 21n. So that would give us a marker 2, but we're being asked to give our answer in standard form. So the first number needs to be between 1 and 10. So how do we get 125 between 1 and 10? We're going to choose to divide that by 100 and compensate by multiplying the 10 to the 21n by 100. So dividing that by 100 gives us 1.25. Now, what is 10 to the power of 21n multiplied by 100? Well, that's like multiplying it by 10 squared. Okay, 10 to the 21n multiplied by 10 squared. When we multiply, we add the powers. So that's going to give us 21n plus 2. So our final answer is 1.25 times 10 to the power of 21n plus 2. Question 21, A part 1, y equals f x minus 5. So the adjustment is inside the function. Okay, If it's inside the function, it affects the x coordinates opposite to what you would expect. So we're going to add 5 to the x coordinate. So 4, 3 becomes 9, 3. Now, when the um, adjustment is outside the function, if it affects the y coordinate, as you would expect. So we're gonna be multiplying the y coordinate by three. So that becomes, the maximum point becomes four, nine. Now for part B, we're comparing the curve that we've been given to the normal sine curve. And we can see what's going on. We've got a multiplication of the x coordinates and a multiplication 
of the y coordinate. So let's start off with the x coordinates. Our first, if we just think about the normal sine curve, our first peak or trough is after 90 degrees, whereas now we can see it's after 30 degrees. So the x values, the x value has gone from 90 to 30. So it's, it's we, we, we're multiplying it by a third. Okay, so the actual x value we've multiplied by a third. Now remember, if it's inside the function, you, you, you do it's opposite to what you'd expect. So you'd kind of expect it to be a third in here in order to go from 90 to 30, but it's opposite to what you expect, so it's going to be 3. Okay, having 3, b being 3 means we multiply the x values by 1 over 3. Now, with regard to a, that's outside the function, that affects the y coordinates. Well, normally our first y coordinate at the peak, okay, 90 degrees would be plus one, but at our peak, the first peak, the y coordinate is minus two. So how do we trans translate one to minus two? We multiply it by minus two. Okay, so for example, the coordinate 91 has moved to the coordinate 30 minus 2. Okay, so we've multiplied the x values by a third, hence y, b is 3, and we've multiplied the y coordinate by minus 2, hence y, a is minus 2. Question 22. So we're going to solve this simultaneous equation. Now, because we've got squares involved, we can't do it by elimination. You can't like double one or triple another, then add or subtract one from another. You've literally got to substitute something in. And in a way, they presented that to you. We know that y equals 2x plus 1. So we're just going to substitute that in for the y value up here. So we're going to replace the y in equation number 1 with 2x plus 1. So that's the key um, thing you need to do to, to uh, gain access to this question. So that is what we need to solve. So just to repeat, the y has been replaced by 2x plus 1. Okay, you've then just got to follow bid mass. So start off by multiplying out uh, 2x plus 1 or squared. That means 2x plus 1 times 2x plus 1. That gives me 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. Then multiply that by 3, gives me line 3. Then tidy it up, gather like terms and take five away from each side to give you this equation here. Now I've noted that all the terms are even, so I can divide by two. <coughs> so I have this quadratic equation to solve here. Now it may well be that you can go straight to the factorized seven x minus one x plus one, if you've learned to do it by inspection, sort of trial and error. Or if you're like me, you find that tricky and stressful, I prefer this longer route. So the way I do it, I say to myself, which two magic numbers multiply to be the 7 times minus 1, which is minus 7, yet at the same time add to be the plus 6, and that is minus 1 and plus 7. I then, my next line of workings, I go to four terms on the right, on the left, rather than three. We basically break the plus 6x down into these two components, the two magic numbers of minus 1x and 7x. Doesn't matter which way around you, you, you set that out. I've gone 7x first, minus x second. So we've gone from three terms to four, with the 6x being split to 7x and minus x. Next step, you fully factorize terms one and two. So that gives me 7x, x plus one. And then, then you fully factorize terms three and four, and you will see that you get a repeated bracket. Your final pair of brackets then comprises the two components that are not, that are not inside a bracket, the 7x minus 1, and the second bracket is the repeated bracket. We then solve this. What value of x makes this first bracket 0? That's when x is a seventh. 7 lots of a seventh take away 1 is 0. Or alternatively, which value of x makes the second bracket zero? That's when x is minus one. So they are our two x values for the solutions. And then to get the, the, the corresponding y, y values, substitute back in. Now in theory, you could substitute it back into either equation, but obviously so much easier to substitute back into the linear one, the, the two x plus one. So here in purple is me substituting in a seventh, 
to give me a y value of one and two sevenths. And here in black is me substituting the minus one solution in to get a y value of minus one. So my final answer is x equals a seventh, y equals one and two sevenths, x equaling minus one, y equaling minus one. Question 23. Now I think I've done this as uh, the easiest way you can, but it seems to be a lot of work just for four marks. But anyway, this is the way I've done it. So I'm starting off with this um, red triangle here. And obviously this angle ABF is going to be 180 take away X because angles in a straight line add up to 180. And I've then got 180 minus X plus this angle here that I've marked in green plus 54 are obviously going to add up to 180. Angles in the red triangle are going to add up to 180. So to work out this angle here, I've done 180 take away 54, take away 180 minus X. Now just be careful here, there's a claw here. So this is minus 180 minus minus X, which is plus X. Those 180s cancel, so there's 180 minus 180, leaving us with this green angle here being X minus 54. So that green angle there is X minus 54. Now therefore, this angle here, angle D, F, E, in the light blue triangle must also be x minus 54 because opposite, vertically opposite angles are equal. So we know that angle there in the light blue triangle is x minus 54. Right, so just park that for now. Now go back to this, this cyclic quad that we've got here, this cyclic quadrilateral. Opposite angles in a cyclic quad add up to 180. So this angle FDC is going to be 180 take away X because together that adds up to 180. And therefore this angle here, FDE is X because that's 180 minus X plus X giving us 180. So that angle there is X. Okay, so just running over that again, that angle there must be 180 minus X because opposite angles in a cyclic quad add up to 180. And if this is 180 minus X, this must be X. So together they add up to 180. So we now know all the angles in triangle FDE in terms of X. So we can say this angle X minus 54 plus this angle X plus this 32 have to add up to 180. That's the angles in the light blue triangle adding up to 180. So simplifying the left hand side, X plus X is 2X. Minus 54 plus 32 is minus 22. Add 22 to both sides, divide by 2, I get X equaling 101 degrees. Question 24. Now, I think this is the hardest question on the paper. I think these vectors where you've got unknown proportions are, are tricky. I mean, it used to be an A-level topic. They've now brought it down to IGCSC. Anyway, let's just start off by processing this bit here top right, which will just pick up some early easier marks, okay? Now, we're told that A to B is 2C. So going from A to B is 2C. And we're told that A to P P to B is in the ratio of three to one. So A to P is three, P to B is one. So A to B is two C. Now what about A to P? Well, that's three quarters of the way along A to B. So that's three quarters of the way along two C. Three quarters of two is three over two. So A, the vector A to P is three over two C's. Now, now that we know A to P, we can also work out what O to P is that we're going to need later. O to P is O to A plus A to P. So that's A plus what we've just worked out, A to P, P to B of 3 over 2C. So O to P is A plus 3 over 2C. So that's really a side working that would pick us up a mark or two that I'm going to come back to later. Now, your overriding way of looking at these questions is um, we're, we're dealing with this ratio of A to Q to Q to C. So the key bit is to establish where Q is, OK, because that's obviously going to just help us with the ratio of A to Q, Q to C. Now, we want to go and establish the, the vector O to Q two completely different ways. 
and then we can we can create a simultaneous equation. So I'm going to start off going from O to Q via A. I'm going to go from O to Q by going O to A and then A to Q, which I've just done down here in light blue. Now O to A is obviously A. Now A to Q is an unknown fraction of A to C, with A to C being minus A plus C. Now this unknown fraction I'm going to call mu. So it's mu lots of A to C, which is mu lots of minus A plus C. That's why you see it. Multiplying out this bracket, we get A minus mu A plus mu C. And then go and factorize. So we're left with the final vector for OQ as being so much of A plus so much of C. And we're just going to park that for now. Okay. And we're now going to go from O to Q by the yellow route, a completely different route, with OQ being a different unknown fraction of O to P. So I'm going to set that up as OQ being lambda times OP. Now, if you remember, we worked out what OP was a bit earlier on. So it's lambda lots of A plus 3 over 2C. Multiplying out, we get OQ being A lambda plus 3 over 2 lambda C. Now, this is the clever bit. Because we've got these two different but same vectors for OQ, the coefficients of A must be equal because it's the same vector, and the coefficients of C must be equal. Okay, so actually I've just needed a bit more fluorescent pen on there. That's also got to be colored in. So the coefficients of A have got to be equal. So that's why one minus mu equals lambda, the green bits being equal. And equally, the pink bits have to be equal. Mu has got to equal three over two lambda. Now, so here we go. Here's another simultaneous equation I can solve. If I call this number one and this number two, I'm going to substitute one into two. So I'm going to have one. I'm going to so one's going into two. So I'm going to have mu equaling three over two one minus mu. And if I process that, I work out that mu equals three fifths. Now remember what mu was. Mu was the fraction along AC we go to get to Q. So I've worked out that A to Q is three fifths. Therefore, Q to C must be the rest. It must be two fifths. So the ratio of A to Q to Q to C is three fifths to two fifths, which multiplying by five gives us a ratio of three to two. Question 25. Now, this is another very difficult question, I think. It's all in getting the diagram right, so bear with me. So, Y is on a bearing of 280 degrees from X. So, go and draw X, draw a line going straight up, and then go around 280 degrees. Okay, which is this bit in black, this bit in black, and draw a line going upwards. So, obviously, if that's 280 clockwise, it's actually creating this um, angle here of 80 degrees above it. Okay, so just so we're clear, we're told that the bearing of Y from X is 280 degrees. Bearings always measured clockwise. So there's the 280 generating an 80 degree angle here, because obviously angles are about a point out up to 360. Now, going over to where Y is, We've really got a C angle here, haven't we? We've got co-interior angles adding up to 180. So because this angle here is 80, this angle over here must be 100 degrees, this angle from north down to that line. So that's good to know. That angle is 100 degrees, angle 2. Now, we're told that Z is on a bearing of 220 from Y. So this black angle here, all the way around here, must be 220 degrees. So if that's 220 degrees all the way around, yet that bit is 100, this angle inside the triangle, ZYX, must be 220 minus 100, which is 120 degrees. Right, now that we've got a side angle side, we know that Y to Z is 6, 
and we know uh, y to x is 3.5 because because we've got side angle side the 6 the 120 the 3.5 we can now go and do cosine rule to work out this length from x to z so that's what i've done up here okay cosine rule and i can work out that the length from x to z is 8.321 now, once I know that, now that I've got a pair, now that I've got a pair, I can use the sine rule to go and work out what theta is, this internal angle here, angle y, x, z. So I'm saying sin theta over 6 equals sin 120 over 8.321 dot, 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 allowing me to work out that theta, this internal angle here, is 38.6. So... If the angle, the bearing, or, uh, the bearing, uh, the black angle all the way around there is 280, yet this little element of it is 38.6, the bearing that I'm looking for, okay, the bearing of Z from X, this angle that I'm calling uh, alpha, this red angle, that's what the question is ask, actually asking me to work out, the bearing of Z from x that's going to be the black angle 280 degrees take away theta that i've just worked out at 38.6 which is 241.4 again i thought the last two questions on this paper were very very challenging